Wait, what? A new StarCraft 2 balance patch? I thought this was a dead game. At the very least, that's what people have been telling me since, like, literally 2011. Basically ever since League of Legends became popular. Anyhow, yesterday, well, technically today over here in the Netherlands, but January 23rd was yesterday. Um, a new balance patch went live for StarCraft 2. So patch 5.0.11 is now live in SC2, which is amazing because this is bringing, well, a full new map pool as well as a new balance patch. And all of this is very significant going into the next competitive year of StarCraft 2. Now, of course, about, I want to say a month or two ago, I made a video as well announcing most of these changes. In case you're wondering what happened to those, that was just for the PTR for the public test realm. And essentially, since that video, all of these changes have been, well, since that patch, I suppose, don't want to really put that much credit on my own video. Uh, but since that video, since that patch, these changes have been tested and they have been updated. So over the course of like the last month and a half, two months or so, we have been yeah, steadily seeing changes be adjusted. And today, the final version of this patch has been announced and it's now live in StarCraft 2. So this video, I want to go over them. Um, I also will be bringing up some of the previous values that were also um, originally announced, so you can probably tell uh, the direction that the game is likely headed into. I will give you my general thoughts on it and my opinion on the changes so far. But let's get started right here at the very top. So it says, Entaro Adun, patch 5.0.11 has arrived, featuring a wide range of balance, quality of life changes, and bug fixes. These changes were curated by our very own StarCraft II community, not me. So, you know, don't blame me, okay? I, I may make videos and do live streams and all that, but uh, not me. Uh, which consisted of pro players, cont not me, not tournament organizers and modders. We want to thank all of them for all their efforts on uh, this update. The StarCraft 2 team. I don't even know if there's a full team at this point. I, I don't know, man. I feel like it's one, one guy who occasionally gets to look at StarCraft 2. But anyways... First off, we're starting up with worker units. No longer needs to wait for full deceleration before beginning to attack. So this is obviously for the SCV, the probe, as well as the drone. Because of the worker's slow deceleration as a result of their mining behavior, they felt very unresponsive when ordered to attack nearby units. This is likely going to have an effect on the early game cheeses every once in a while. I mean, obviously, you're still going to be fully reliant on your own micro, but now there's ever so slightly less randomness, a little bit less RNG. For example, if there's like an early game, I don't know, Terran versus Zerg, where there's a bunch of barracks being built on the other side of the map, if the Zerg finds it early and sends a couple of drones down towards those SCVs, they're going to be able to pick off those workers a little bit easier. That being said, I don't really expect this to be too, too significant. Next up, we have the Creep Tumor. Creep, obviously, in general, very oppressive for a very long time in StarCraft 2, and I honestly think even after this it's gonna be too strong. But anyways, the cooldown has been increased on the Creep Tumor itself, so before you can spread it, from 10.71 to 13.5 seconds. Okay, and then the sight range have reduced, uh, or <laughs> rather the sight range has been reduced from 11 to 10. I have played quite a few games with the new balance patch, and I gotta say, I can't tell a difference. Um, that's probably due to the fact that I am never fully on point with my creep spread anyways. Now, a lot of people are saying that this isn't a very significant nerf at all, because if you analyze, for example, even Serals or Darks or Raynors or whoever's replays, um, they will also not be fully on point with this, but for obvious reasons, this is a nerf and a pretty significant one as well. So, it clarifies where the vision provided reaches, okay, as the sight range now matches the creep spread created by the tumor. Yeah, so previously you could see a little bit further, which is no longer the option or no longer the case. Slightly reduces the amount of creep spread in the early game from the Zerg player, especially in situations with multiple creep tumors in a small area or builds without units such as Hellions to delay the creep, right? So, overall, this is, yeah. Yeah, this is a small buff, I suppose. This is a, a small nerf right over here. We have another one over here that is honestly not particularly consequential. Hatchery, Lair, and Hive now have their sight arranged, increased from 10, 11, and 12 to 12. So in the past, the Hatchery, it had 10 range. The Lair, it had 11 vision range. Now it's all going to have 12 flat. This means that, say for example, the only the only real practical use case where I can see this coming into play is say like an early game Zerk versus Zerk. There were builds where you would go for like a 12 pool against your Zerk's opponent or your Zerk opponent, and then you would send out one drone pretty early, and you'd morph in one spine crawler on the edge of the creep. And in the previous patch, well, up until yesterday, you would not be able to see that uh, that spine crawler building. 
uh, but usually you would see the drone or at the very least you would realize that something is not quite right. Now you're going to be able to see it. Uh, the creep spread interval has been decreased from 0.3 to 0.25. This is an additional change that wasn't in the previous set of changes, if I'm not mistaken. So this increases the rate of creep spread from these structures by 20%, but it does not affect creep spread from creep tumors. So buildings will spread creep a little bit faster around themselves. So it increases the vision to match the creep spread radius similar to the creep tumor side change. The creep spread rate is increased to allow for more consistent wall-offs as well as help with early game defense. Yeah, so sometimes in, uh, a, once again, in Zerg versus Zerg, this is most commonly the case. But sometimes if you want to go for a wall-off, say you go for a pool first built and then you want to go for a hatchery on the low ground. So say like a 16 supply spawning pool into a 17 supply hatchery. Um, if you then want to make a wall off at the front, so you want to, for example, put your bailing nest as part of the wall, you wouldn't be able to do that because you didn't go for a hatchery first and the creep would not be spread far enough. Um, with this change, you can do that a little bit more reliably. Kind of nice. Kind of nice. And I think overall, yeah, very minor, but... Nice change for sure. This is a big one, and this is something that has been scaled back a little bit. So after casting Abduct, the Viper cannot move or use abilities for 0.57 seconds. So previously, this value was slightly higher. Um, the original, yeah, the original proposed value was 0.71. So right now it's 0.57. Um, as far as these values go, by the way, in case you're wondering why some of these numbers are going to sound a little bit funny, um, this has to do with the way that the original game was designed. Essentially, the game was designed for the normal game speed, but all of the competitive games are played on the faster game speed, which uses a percentage. Anyways, long story short, these values are going to look a little funny uh, because of uh, StarCraft II being old and, you know, the game going through a lot of iterations. So after casting Abduct, yeah, you will not be able to move the Viper for a little bit. I've casted quite a few games already where this is a significant change. Um, yeah, this this combined with some of the other late game changes that we'll see in just a second, um, very significant, very significant. I actually like this nerf. I think the Viper is overall way too strong anyways. Um, so this change over here is, uh, yeah, very welcome. So prevents the Viper from being able to simultaneously abduct two units, as well as makes the Viper more vulnerable to being killed after abducting, which is fair enough. This one over here is also quite significant, right? So I like the upcoming changes a lot, but then again, I'm a Zerg player at heart myself. So the Ultralisk, this is something I have been calling for for literally like five years. Um, if you go back to my videos, you will hear me occasionally mention the Ultralisk size reduction. So the problem that the Ultralisk has is that it gets stuck on everything. On Zerglings, on Banelings, on it gets stuck on anything. So because it's smaller, it will be able to get into the battle a little bit easier. And right now, actually, especially when it's got like the speed upgrade as well, it kind of reminds me a little bit of like the Brood War Ultralisk. And honestly, that's a theme as well with the Hydra, um, as well as the, the Brood Lord. I mean, they look a little bit more like Guardians right now, but we'll get to them shortly. I like this change a lot. Yes, so the Ultralisk often gets stuck against the Zerg's own units due to their large size and slower movement speed than other Zerg melee units. This should help them get into a fight more easily. So Ultras are actually very strong if they manage to get into the battle. And that's usually where things get a little bit funny. So they also have an additional change called the increased distance target can move. Oh, sorry. Increased distance that the target can move before the Ultralisk attack is cancelled from 1 to 1.25. Range to begin the attack is unchanged, right? So originally we had something about range slop. Um, same idea over here. Um, it's going to make the Ultra better overall. And since the Viper is a little bit weaker, I like this change a lot. Also, because I personally am not a huge fan. Maybe this is just lore-wise, but also skill-wise. So, um, lore-wise, in my mind, right, Zerk is that big swarmy race that just kind of overwhelms everything. And the fact that you're very reliant on spellcasters and that you sometimes make like six Vipers and then like 20 Infestors, I think that's kind of lame. Um... So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not good at controlling both Infestors and Vipers at the same time either. So, you know, a little bit of, uh, of a bias towards my own uh, capabilities there. Um, but, yeah, I, I like this change overall. Less reliance on spellcasters and, you know, more strength on the late game units in general. I actually want to skip the Hydra for a second and go to the Brute Lord as well. So the Brute Lord movement speed, because it's, you know, kind of similar. The Brute Lord movement speed has been increased from 1.97 to 2.24. And the duration of the spawn Brute Links has been reduced from 5.71 to 3.57. So the Brute Lord overall is faster. Um, the original proposed value for the movement speed was 2.3. But apparently 2.24 is what we settled on. 
It's a percentage change once again. Um, the Brutling itself, yes. So that one, these are the original proposed values with the new patch. So the Brute Lord's slow speed forces the Zerg to play defensive until the map is mined out, causing games where it's used to become where, where it is used rather to become very slow paced. The, dura the duration of the Brute Links is reduced to weaken the units in engagements where there is nothing to quickly clear the Brute Links, as well as preventing the Zerg from continuously sending waves of Brute Links from a longer distance than the Brute Lord's attack range. Right, so we've had a couple of games where the Zerks will throw Brute Links on the ground and then they will throw more Brute Links on the Brute Links. Right? And that will allow you to send wave after wave after wave of Brutling towards the opponent. Now, it's kind of cool to see in like the dozen or so games, not even a dozen, I think I've casted maybe like three games where that's been the case, but um, especially Dark managed to uh, yeah, get some success out of that. Um, since the Brutling will now die a little bit faster, it is no longer really an option. I don't know if they fixed that in this patch, but one unseen circumstance or one consequence, I guess, of this change is that the buildings of the Zerg structures, right? If you kill one of the Zerg structures, those Brutlings actually also die a little bit quicker. Not very substantial, but um, yeah, I would imagine they probably also do die a little bit quicker because of this, unless it's in the miscellaneous uh, section at the bottom of this page. We'll get to that in a second. Um, overall, though, this once again reminds me a little bit of the Starcraft Brood War unit, the Guardian. Um, because, well, I mean, <laughs> they obviously throw little balls, right? They don't have Brutlings or anything, but since the Brutlings are not as yeah, significant anymore and they die much faster, um, they're also a little bit quicker. Yeah, I, I can see I can see the, the comparison there. So I am a big fan, personally, of both the Brute Lord as well as the Ultra Change, just because I think they're cool units, but we don't really see them used that often. Hydralisks. So Hydras are pretty significant overall. Let me just pull up the original values as well, because they also got adjusted. So muscular augments, this is the movement speed. Um, originally, so, well, originally, as in like two months ago, the proposed value was to increase this from 0.79 to 1.05. Right now it's got improved to 1 or 0 0.98, but only off creep. So they're faster than they were in the past off creep, but not as fast as they were originally when the new patch first got announced. The Hydra does high damage, uh, this one also, by the way, this is the same thing. So this makes them a little bit more microable. Again, the same value as we already had in the past. Um, well, same value as we had with the previous first version of this particular patch. So the Hydra's high damage point combined with its fast attack caused kiting to not be very effective. The speed is increased off creep to allow for easier retreating from engagements and repositioning of the army, as retreating from an engagement on the map would often result in many Hydralisks being picked off. Excellent. We have the Ravager. Um, so this one also got adjusted slightly. Original value for this was 12.9 seconds. Now it's going to go up to 12.14 apparently. No idea who comes up with these values, but it is what it is. So the build time is increased from 8.57 to 12.14, and it removed the random delay of up to 3 or 0.36 seconds. So this forces the Zerg to prepare slightly earlier to defend attacks, as well as reduce the strength of morphing roaches into Ravagers during fights to heal them. Should make roach-based all-ins slightly easier to defend in ZVT and ZVZ. Fair enough. I honestly don't think this is a very significant change at all. Um, and honestly, most of these changes are probably not going to be super consequential below, like, the tippity-top of the skill level. You'll see that actually with basically all of the changes that we're going to go over today. Many of them are not going to be very significant at all, but if you are a Zerg player, and I, I have, I've done a lot of, well, Zerg gameplay myself, and I've obviously done a lot of coaching with Zerg as well. Um, one thing that I've seen over the years, many, many, many times is that a lot of Zerg players get stuck in Diamond League. A lot of Zerg players get stuck for... Well, there's a couple of reasons as to why, but one of the very significant reasons is that at that point, at that point, you have to start using Spellcasters. And I wonder how far you can go without making Spellcasters if the Ultralisk is easier to use and so is the Brute Lord. I think you can probably stick around on just like swarmy units instead. And personally, that is my favorite way of playing Zerk myself. So I, yeah, I'm overall a massive fan of this. Um, I think the Zerk changes in this patch are excellent. I can definitely suggest a couple more additions, but I really, really like these changes. And again, I say this as someone who plays Zerk primarily. I've spent about 95% of my time playing 1v1 with Zerk. So uh, yeah, I am a little bit biased, but there is no denying that I really do like these Zerk changes quite a bit. Okay, so next up, Protoss. 
Protoss got the short end of the stick with this particular patch. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, I will give you my thoughts on this, of course, as well. Um, let's go over them uh, really quickly. Well, really quickly. I don't know. S somewhat quickly. Probably not too quick. First up, the shield battery. Battery overcharge, shield recharge rate. Uh, the bonus has been reduced from 100% to 50%. So this reduces the total shield's recharge from 1440 to 1080, which is not a... Well, it's also a resolution. Um, 1440p, by the way, is what you probably should be using in 2020. Anyway, uh, 2023. What year is it? Sound like that. Um, but overall, they're going to be slightly less effective. So previously, battery overcharge made it difficult to take an engagement regardless of army differences until it expired unless the shield battery could be destroyed. This should give the attacker a chance to take an engagement if they have a significant army lead. Right, so previously, and this will still kind of be the case, um, the shield battery can kind of feel like a band-aid, right? Where like, oh no, I've made all these mistakes. Activate the band-aid and now I'm alive for another minute. Uh, at least that's what it feels like. I have never been a particularly big fan of those sorts of mechanics, but I mean, it's still going to be very useful. I've casted quite a few games featuring Protoss. This is definitely a nerf, don't get me wrong, um, but assuming you play a tight game, I don't think this is really going to be that significant of a change. That being said, this is definitely going to, yeah, if you mess up in the early game and you go up against just a standard timing attack, you're not going to be able to stay alive as easily anymore. The Observer. The movement speed has been increased. The Gravitic Booster's movement speed, which is an upgrade, has been increased from point or 1.31 to 1.41, maintaining a 50% speed increase. So that is 50% improvement from that previous value. And then the model size has been increased as well. Now, if I look at the original model size, I want to say uh, that the... Yeah, so the original proposed model size change was 17.5%, but apparently it's been changed to 10%. So this is the visual size only. It does not affect interactions with Ranger Vision. Um, I looked at the Observer for like three minutes after the new patch was originally announced with the like first version of the patch. And I honestly couldn't notice that it was 17.5% bigger. I mean, I could notice because I obviously knew that it was changed, but otherwise I don't think I would have told. I would have really uh, yeah, been able to notice the difference. Um, this is going to make it slightly bigger overall. I don't think this is very significant at all, but I really do like the fact that they're a little bit uh, a little bit faster. So, rewards use of observers for active scouting and creep denial and allows them to keep up with the Protoss army easier. The increased size helps the opponent be able to see when an observer is present if they are actively looking for it, as it can be incredibly punishing to make a decision under the belief that the opponent is not aware of your action. Yeah. <laughs> incredibly punishing. Okay, well, that is, uh, that, uh, you know, it's a little bit of uh, editing right here going on by uh, whoever wrote this patch note. But anyhow, um, <laughs> incredibly punishing. The word incredibly didn't need to be here. It can be punishing, man. There were no words such as incredibly during the Zork section. Anyhow, uh, I think this is a very good change. Yeah, small change again, but again, that's the theme in general with this patch. Um, I like it a lot. I think it's a good change. Archon. So the reduced collision radius from structures is, well, reduced from 0.75 to 0.56. This allows Archons to pass through single tile gaps between buildings. Does not affect their collision. I've mentioned this many times before in the past as well. We're missing a period there. It is okay. Um, you can now move Archons through a wall a little bit easier. So it makes the Archon better at defending with in the Protoss base against units such as Mutalisks, also helps prevent frustrating scenarios where the Archons can be stuck after being recalled. Right, so this is... The, the most common scenarios where Archons seem to get stuck, because usually Archons don't really come out until after you get like a third base up and running. So usually it's not like the natural really is the issue necessarily. Say for example, you're playing a Zerg versus Protoss and you're pushing on the other side of the map and you're like, oh crap, there's Mutalisks in my base right now. What do I do? Usually you end up recalling your army, right? And you try and defend. What happens oftentimes is that at that point, since you're putting out a lot of fires, because usually with Mutas, at the same time, there's going to be a bunch of Zerklings at your third base as well. You're putting out a lot of fires. You don't really pay attention to your natural as much anymore at that point in the game. Um, so you will then go for an attack and you realize, wait a second, my Archons are still on the other side of the map because they're stuck in the natural. So this basically means that the Archons can fit between that small space where they normally would get stuck in the natural, just like the other Protoss units can. So this will make him easier to use. This is a quality of life change that we should have had a decade ago. But it's here now. <laughs> the High Templar, movement speed increased as well. Again, small change. 
Increases the speed of ground-based armies with high Templar support, allowing a more effective map movement in combination with the Viper's Abduct nerf. Should help in reducing the amount of value generated by Vipers over time when combined with the Protoss air armies. Right, so you are going to be able to feed back a little bit easier, and obviously the High Templar are not going to be too far behind your army if you're, well, using them on one big control group instead um, of, like, having them separately hotkeyed. Um, I like this change. I think it's good overall. Not very significant. I mean, it's nice. Good quality of life change, uh, but nothing all too crazy. This is a pretty big one, although, again, these values... Let me just look up the original value. So the original proposed value was to reduce the radius of the Purification Nova from 1.5 to 1.35, but now it's going to be 1.3575. There you go. They got a couple percentage extra. Um, it reduces the maximum potential damage a Disruptor can deal against an unaware opponent, while not significantly affecting its usage of zoning away enemy ground units or picking off stationary units from a distance. Right, so this is a pretty significant change. You can still fit a lot of units into the big ball area, but obviously you got to be very careful uh, that you don't accidentally, uh, yeah, over... Like, the thing is, if you reduce the, the, the radius, you also effectively reduce the range, right? So say, for example, you think, I could be bowling that ghost that's kind of just sitting there at the very edge of my vision. Um, you're going to have to overextend the disruptor a little bit as well, because, you know, your maximum range is also going to be slightly smaller. This is a pretty significant nerf. Then again, disruptors were probably a little too common. So I personally don't mind this all too much. Um, I'll, I'll give you my final thoughts here in just a moment, okay? But I, I yeah, I, I do like this change. But I wonder if there should be some sort of compensation for this reduction. Either way, carriers. So the interceptor attack target priority has been reduced from 20 to 19. So attackers now prioritize other units over interceptors. Originally, there was also a proposed change to make the interceptor ships... Uh, have less shields, so the original proposed change was to have their shields go from 40 to 30 and their flying radius around the target to be increased as well. Those things did not make it to this final version of the patch. However, this change is still a very helpful quality of life change. Again, if you are a Zerg player below like the top 50 in the world, maybe even the top 20 in the world, because basically, so, so at the top level, Carriers are not particularly strong, and they're not really used that often. But everyone below the tippity top of the skill level absolutely gets destroyed by carriers, myself included. It has been, I would say, five, six years before I felt comfortable in the late game of Zerg versus Protoss myself. And I have practiced it. I have practiced it a ton. Uh, this change is a very nice one. So for the majority of players across skill level... Across skill level? Okay. It is too difficult to engage into carriers with an army that is more focused on destroying the carriers themselves, such as Vikings and Corruptors. This should allow players to use units intended for fighting carriers to actually be used effectively, even if the micro requirement in engage it right. So, so normally, right, in the previous version, what you would do if you have a group of Corruptors or a group of Vikings, you would attack move them forward and they would start engaging the carriers. At least that is your intention. Oftentimes, what would actually happen is that they would be derping around trying to kill the interceptor ships instead. With this change, the carriers are going to have a higher priority and the interceptors are not going to be as important. Meaning that assuming your Vikings and your Corruptors are in range of the carrier, they're going to be target firing that instead of the interceptors. Very significant change for everybody below the tippity top of the skill level, because the guys at the tippity top of the skill level would be target firing properly anyways. I'm excited for this one myself, but again, um, we'll, we'll have to talk about the overall consequence of all of this. Uh, we have the build time of the century that's been reduced as well from 26 to 22, fair enough, and the movement speed has been increased too. So 3.5, this was not in the original proposed list of changes, but the sentry will now hopefully be slightly less punishing to use, which I think is great. Allows for slightly earlier scout in the early game with hallucination, right? So about four seconds. As well as helps the sentry keep up with the Protoss army when using Guardian Shield. Sentry's overall very critical unit, but we don't really see them being used as often as they definitely deserve. Um, especially in combination with the upcoming change right here with the Forge, where basically all the upgrades are going to be quicker to, uh, to research, you might be able to, yeah, make sentries a little bit easier in the earlier stages of the game and then go for timing attacks. So the Forge level 1 upgrades, their research time has been reduced. Same for the level 2, same for the level 3. Let me just compare the values real quick. So originally, 
This one was supposed to have a seven second reduction, yes. This one was supposed to have a nine second reduction, and this one was supposed to have an 11 second reduction. L looks about all right to me. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, recent, maybe this is a rounding error, I'm not sure. Anyways, recently, Protoss have been heavily relying on disruptors and ground engagements, with the nerf to disruptors as well as battery overcharge. Earlier upgrades should give some compensation for fighting strength on the ground. I think this is a very nice change for Protoss. I wouldn't be surprised if this is going to open up some very significant opportunities for timing attacks once again. Timing attacks have not been as popular lately. I mean, we still see them, obviously, but... Um, especially like double forge timing attacks. I'm personally a big fan, especially with that like Haas space playstyle where you go mass zealot. Being able to get upgrades out in total, like what, 7, 9, 11 seconds, you're gonna be able to get them out 27 seconds faster? That's huge. Again, at a high level. Everybody below like Grandmaster League probably won't benefit from this all too much. Um, but this is a, a very nice change for sure because you can hit earlier. Right, so again, say when you, you want to go for a timing attack, you will be able to hit right before an additional set of Terran units will pop out of those barracks. Which, yeah, really does add up very, very quickly. This is certainly going to require a little bit of time and a little bit of practice. Oh, we also have a Dark Temper thing over here. The Shadow Stride attack delay has been reduced from 0.75 to 0.71. So this is just yeah, a standardization. Fair enough. Um, <clears throat> very small, but fair enough. Um, overall, overall. Let, let's look at this, right? So shield battery nerf, significant. Disruptor nerf, significant. Forge changes, significant as well. The thing is that I don't know if this makes up for those other two changes that I have just mentioned. I think it will probably be fine over time, but if you also keep in mind the Brute Lord and the Ultralist change and the Hydra being a little bit faster, and we'll get to the Terran changes momentarily, but the Terran changes are also pretty cool. It does feel to me like Protoss has got the short end of the stick. Um, it's gonna take some practice for sure. The thing is that I am Katowice kind of is coming up pretty soon, right? So that is the StarCraft II World Championships, and it's the biggest tournament of the year. It's coming up in just a couple weeks from now, and... I've got a feeling that since this patch is obviously the version of the game that we're going to be playing at that tournament, that Protoss is likely going to need a little bit more time before they're actually super comfortable with all of these changes. Because while a lot of it is small, Protoss... It works a little bit differently than Terran and, and Zerk, because usually you just have a very small amount of units in the early game anyways. Like, the early game build orders and the early game strategies for Protoss are very tight. And I've got a feeling it might get a little bit tricky for Protoss, at the very least initially with the patch. Overall, though, I do like these changes. I think the shield battery was a little bit too strong. I think the Observer Arc on High Templar changes are all nice. I do think that the Disruptor was also a little bit too strong. Um, I love the Carrier change, but again, that's a little bit of Zerg bias coming in. I think the Sentry change is reasonable. I think the Forge changes are excellent. But it does feel a little flimsy if you compare it to the other changes that are made to the game. Uh, there is, of course, a chance that this is going to require like an additional follow-up. But at the very least, if we look at the initial win-loss ratio, obviously we also have a new StarCraft 2 map pool, but if you look at the initial win-loss ratio for Protoss, it isn't looking all too great. Um, I've seen some numbers thrown around on the new patch with the new maps so far, and then at the tournament level only, of Protoss winning like 35% of their games, uh, which is low. Now, it is certainly possible that this is going to take some time, because um, especially these Forge changes do allow for some yeah, variety and some opportunities once again. But um, yeah, we'll have to see how this, how this settles. We'll have to see how this settles. General consensus from the pro Protoss players that I've asked and that I've seen you know, talk about this patch is that they actually like the changes quite a bit. I've seen a couple of tweets here and there of, for example, Skillis mentioning he thought it was fine. And a bunch of other players mentioning that this is, yeah, should, should all be A-OK. -okay. But um, Protoss in general... Not, 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 not as exciting as a list of changes as Zurich, at the very least. All right, so let's talk about the Terran changes real quick. So, I mean, real quick, real quick. Let me actually drink some water as well, because I've been talking for a while. Mm. This is a change that the Viking one, it was not in the original list of changes. So the Viking, the fighter mode, the damage point has been reduced from 0.12 to 0.04. So the fighter mode is the flying mode of the Viking. 
Vikings have a slow speed and a high damage point for a flying unit, making it hard to effectively micro them other than simply shift-clicking the enemy units. This should allow for more effective micro when attention is given to them. So you may have noticed this as well when you're trying to target fire down, I don't know, a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, Colossi, for example, from a distance, or Brute Lords or something like that. The Viking can feel a little bit floaty, a little bit unresponsive. This will make them easier to f micro, which, you know, increasing micro ability of units, I think that should always be uh, a goal in StarCraft 2, right? Like having more control over your units, definitely not a bad idea. In order to offset some of the ghost changes, the Liberator is also going to be 25 gas cheaper. So Liberator usage has fallen off over time as Zerks have been uh, building or have built more queens in the early game and the transition into Liberator against Protoss later in the game is too expensive. A lot of that also has to do with the Liberator build time. Liberators take forever to produce. Um, this is going to make them cheaper, so it's easier to transition into. I like this change overall, because like it mentions already over here, Liberators in general, not very, very strong. Um, or Well, they're strong, but like not very commonly used. We see a couple of them here and there, and obviously there's some of those late-game TVPs where we suddenly have like 20 of them. But it's a difficult transition to make. And in general, Terrans tend to stick around on that mid-game army for a very long time instead. So hopefully this is going to make that transition a little bit easier. The Ghost. The Ghost has a couple of significant changes. So first off, the Enhanced Shockwaves upgrade is removed. This will make them... So the Enhanced Shockwaves, it was an upgrade that has been around in the game for quite some time. It was added, well... I don't know exactly when, but it was at, a, you know, not at the beginning of the game, but quite a few years ago at this point. It essentially increases the radius of EMP from, I believe, 1.5 to 2. Right now, that upgrade is no longer there. However, the EMP default radius has been increased from 1.5 to 1.75, so meeting halfway. Pretty significant change there. Um, but honestly, I think ghosts in general, um, obviously, way too much value. I mean, uh, you, you can't play the game without ghosts, and for a spellcaster, I think they're a little bit too powerful overall, so I don't mind this change myself. Um, steady targeting is cancelled, so that is the snipe ability, which takes about a second and a half to channel. The steady targeting is cancelled if the target moves more than 14 range away from the ghost while casting. So the cast range of steady targeting is 10. So, say for example, there's a couple Ultralisks, you move your Ghost in, you start up your Snipe. If the Ultra starts running right away, the Snipe is cancelled. Some people have complained about this change, but I honestly can't really come up with a negative reason. I mean, obviously it's going to make the Ghost slightly less powerful, but the fact that there is, like, disengage potential... Again, a good change for StarCraft 2, right? The fact that you can actually, like, that is where some of the most interesting gameplay in the game is coming from, where players clash and then are like, no, 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 I can't actually do this. This is going to allow the Zerks in particular, I mean, you won't really see this all too often in the other matchups, but this is going to allow Zerk in particular to disengage a bit easier. Now, I wouldn't have minded seeing this change maybe coming up later after we see how both the Brute Lord speed improvement as well as the Ultralisk less derpiness uh, are going to work out, because combined with that, it might be a bit much. But, I, yeah, I do like the idea of making this steady targeting a little bit less powerful. Steady targeting can now also be manually cancelled. So, if you want to run your ghost, like, say, you queue up a couple of snipes, but then you're like, oh, crap, I can't actually do this, uh, you can now manually cancel it. Seems like a good idea. So, the maximum potential of EMP is reduced, weakening the ghost against late-game Protoss armies and spellcasters, while giving it more power immediately, before the enhanced shockwave upgrade would have been researched. The steady targeting range cap reduces the punishing effect that ghosts can have against biological units, where moving anywhere near the Terran army would require a full commitment, as retreating units would always die in combination with using scan for vision. Right. So, biological units, every Zerg unit is biological. The ability is now manually cancelable, Cancelable. Alright, that's not a word you read all too often. To give more micro potential in situations where the ghost is in danger, especially when it is clear it will not be able to finish casting regardless. So I think this change is excellent. Um, I, originally, I originally mentioned that this might remove a little bit too much power from the Terran late game. I think the change to the Liberator here to make up for some of that is really quite nice. Um, Liberators are, in general, good as well against, for example, uh, Ultralisks, right? So now maybe transitioning towards Liberators and Ghost, or, you know, Liberators alone, is, is actually not a terrible option. Although that's going to require a bunch of practice. Benshi. Um, I've got a video 
that... Okay, so I gotta talk about this for a little bit. I have a video that I recorded yesterday that I am publishing later this week. In that video, we have Mass Banshee play. I'm very excited for it. I think it's actually one of the coolest games. It's Rainer versus uh, Hero Marine. So Hero Marine going Mass Banshee in one of the games. Spoiler alert, I guess. He also plays Mass Battle Mech. Mass Cyclone. Very cool stuff. Anyhow, um, Hyperflight Rotors is a powerful change. Let's just leave it at that, okay? In that video, though, I mentioned, too, that I will likely make an update video as soon as the final version of the patch is live, and I'm contemplating on whether or not I'm actually going to do that. By the time you're watching that video, which hopefully you will, I have already made that video. So, yeah, I've got, like, four videos that I've already got ready to go, and they're already finished. I, yeah, was originally not planning on... Anyways, I might be talking in those upcoming next couple of videos about the patch and some of the changes and how it could be working out and, you know, what the final version of this patch is likely going to be and all that. But, you know, at the time when I was recording it, the patch was not final yet. Anyhow, Hyperflight Rotors. The research time has been reduced. Like, you can be very smart, okay? If a bunch of people in the comment section are like, Oh my god, Loco, you don't even know that the new patch is live yet? You can tell them in the comment section that I didn't know at the time. I mean, you could. Hyperflight Rotors, the research time has been reduced by 21 seconds. Hyperflight Rotors cost reduced. I don't understand, by the way, how we got to 100 seconds. I feel like this would probably also be like, I don't know, 87.3 or something. Anyway, Hyperflight Rotors is also a little bit cheaper. Hyperflight Rotors is the speed upgrade for the Benchy. And we never see it, but it's very strong. I promise. Cyclone. I'm excited for this one too. So the mag field accelerated damage bonus has changed from plus 20 versus armored to plus 10 versus all. Lock on. So this is uh, a set of changes that was not in the original proposed patch. Lock on will now prioritize air units that threaten the cyclone. So air units with an anti ground attack. Spellcasters. Okay. Lock on auto cast range has been increased from 7 to 7.5, similar to the change from Heart of the Swarm to Legacy of the Void with the weapon scan range. The auto cast range is increased, so attack moved cyclones do not move below the actual cast range of cyclones before it acquires a target. The ability is still a cast at 7 range, no period. Okay. Overall, cyclones are a very niche unit. In the previous version of StarCraft 2, we see one, maybe two, but other than that, not very commonly used. In the past, we've had battle mech. Battle mech being Hellions, Cyclones, and sometimes Benchies. I can tell you that uh, from that Hero Marine Rainer series, that Cyclone Benchie, very fun. Battle mech, once again, back on the menu. And I think that's the goal with this change overall. I am very excited to see how these changes are going to work out, specifically for the Zerg versus Terran matchup, because it's basically been like all bio, or like that very slow, laid-back vanilla mech. This is going to make it a little bit more, um, yeah, it's going to give you like a, a mobile mech option, which I am very excited for. Honestly, this is a unit comp like Hellion Cyclone Benshee. It's a unit composition that has a ton of potential. And since it's very gas heavy, you will usually find yourself with a bunch of minerals. If you don't make too many Hellions, you can expand all over the map while putting on pressure, especially with the creep spread change as well. I think this is actually really sick. I think it's going to be a lot of fun to see this develop over the course of the next couple months. But anyways, the Macfield Accelerator damage change attempts to make the unit slightly more well-rounded as many of the Terran's factory units are too specialized into certain roles. The lock-on prioritization air units, uh, or prioritizing rather, air units will help when engaging armies such as Mutalisk and Zerklings, preventing all the lock-ons from being wasted on Zerklings and the mech army being overwhelmed in the air. Yeah, so this is a big one. Um, also against things like, for example, uh, uh, Swarm Hosts, this could be could be quite significant. Um, the fact that the lock-on is now not wasted as quickly, very nice. Sensor Tower range reduced from 10 or by 10%, so Sensor Tower slow down the game by making it impossible to catch the Terran out of position defensively, especially in TVT. This will give less warning time for attacks or force the Sensor Towers to be built slightly more forward, giving the opponent an easier chance to destroy them. 27 range is still super big. There's nothing else in the game that has did that much range, so, you know, this is still a, a fantastic structure. Personally, I'm not the biggest fan of sensor towers, but overall, um, a slight range reduction, I guess, can be... I'm, I'm by no means a Terran versus Terran expert, uh, but the Terran players seem to enjoy this. In combination with the Raven, this is much more significant for the TVT matchup. So, the Raven has gone through a lot of iterations over the course of this new patch. This is the final version. 
So the gas cost is reduced from 200 gas to 150. Build time has also been reduced quite a lot. Corvid reactor, which is the energy upgrade, has been removed. Anti-armor missile armor has been reduced from 3 to 2. Auto turrets have been changed as well from 10.7 or 10 seconds of life to 7.9. Auto turret health has been reduced, their armor has been reduced, and they no longer are affected by Neo's 2 armor, which gives them plus 1 armor when you have finished researching it in the NG bay. Overall, overall, because this is quite the list. Raven, slightly less powerful. However, it's going to be slightly easier to produce. The idea behind this change is that the Raven is currently only used, or previously it was only used in a Terran versus Terran matchup, and it's still going to be amazing in TVT, so maybe this does not necessarily have the uh, effect there that they're hoping for, but anyways, maybe this is going to open up the opportunity as well to use it in Terran versus Protoss, and also in Terran versus Zerk. Since it's significantly cheaper to build, and it's faster to produce as well, I can imagine there might be some cool builds where you go for Cyclones, Hellions, Benchies, you mix in a cheeky little Raven, deny a bunch of creep spread. I've always been a big fan of Raven openers against Zerk myself. And um, yeah, this is certainly going to make that a lot more viable. So we'll, we'll have to see. I think this is probably one of those changes that like we'll probably see a lot in like half a year from now. Where it's kind of like an under-the-radar change, where in uh, initially we won't really be seeing that much use out of this. But then over time, it's, you know, used more and more frequently. Uh, the debuff color, by the way, of the anti armor missile has also been changed. I like this change a lot, actually. It looks way nicer now. Anyway, so this increases the viability of a Raven to be used as a detector unit by reducing the investment. Some of the strength is removed from the anti-armor missile as a result of the smaller investment. And auto turret durability is significantly weakened to prevent mass auto turret strategies from being too strong in Terran versus Terran. While not significantly affecting the ability of the Raven to use auto turrets for harass in TVP. Excellent set of changes right here for Terran. I really like this. I'm hoping that Battle Mech is once again going to be a go-to option for uh, the Terran versus Zerk matchup, but I'm also excited to see some of these other changes coming into play. Overall, I gotta say, I'm a big fan of the Zerk changes. I love the Zerk changes. I really like the Terran changes. I am not 100% sold on the Protoss changes. That is uh, the TLDR. I guess the real TLDR of the whole list of changes, though, is that compared to the original proposed set, this is all tuned down a little bit. So compared to the original set that we had a couple of months ago, this is like the slightly less extreme version of that overall, making it, well, really quite a, a minor list in general. Anyways, um, I mean, it's it's a cool set of changes, don't get me wrong, but it's not the, nothing all too crazy. No new units or, you know, significant early game shakeups or anything like that. Um, we also have a very long list of... Oh my god, I have a lot more reading to do. Uh, we also have a very long list of miscellaneous bug fixes and quality of life changes. <sighs> Luckily, I've got my big water bottle. I, I brought it out for this for this video. Mm. The Banshee. First missile is no longer delayed by 0.11 seconds after attacking. Completes. Previously, the Banshee could even start moving away before the missile was launched. That is true. The second missile will also be 0.11 seconds faster as there remains a... 0.11 second gap between the two missiles. Okay, so this is just a visual, right? Actually, no, it's not just a visual. It's, it's going to make it feel more reliable, but you actually are going to be able to fire slightly quicker. Fair enough. Um, factory increases the maximum spawn radius by one. So you're actually going to be able to produce units out of the factory a little bit easier. Widowine reduces the, or reduced rather, the random unburrow slash burrow delay from 0.3 seconds to 0.18. The average time remains the same. No longer targets Zerk cocoons without a manual order. Again, something that is going to help out all of the non-professional Terrans out there, which is nice. No longer targets units affected by neural parasite without a manual order. Very nice. Very good. Cyclone. Fix an issue where the lock-on could enter cooldown while the cyclone is loaded into a transport. Lock-on no longer targets or cocoons without a manual order. Excellent. Shield battery. Fix an issue where repeatedly issuing a stop command could increase the restore... Yeah. <laughs> I didn't find out until this one a while ago, but... Could increase the restore shield regeneration rate. Fix an issue where animation models created snapshots in the fog. Good. That's been a bug for a while. And fix the restore tooltip to uh, not scaling values to the game speed. Okay, fair enough. Fix an issue where adepts could not be ordered to cancel the shade ability when selected with shades who are warping in. Nice. 
can now be ordered to load into a warp prism while shading, automatically canceling the shade. Very nice. Queen, fix an issue where the initial creep tumors could be canceled. Yeah, okay, fair enough. That is not very helpful. No longer unable to receive basic orders for 0.6 seconds after spawning. Very good. Sometimes when a queen spawns, it would just kind of sit there for a little bit and you couldn't really do much with it if you were too good with your macro. This is going to make it feel more responsive. The Lurker, same change as the Widow Mine. Attacks will no longer be blocked by certain low ground terrain features and fix an issue where units loaded into transports could be damaged. Good. Hydra, now has the same attack cooldown on attack animation speed with attacks at melee and range. Previously, melee attacks had a longer animation and shorter cooldown. Okay. Fix an issue where Morph to Lurker would be cancelled with a smart command issued immediately after the Morph command. Okay. Remove the Morph to Lurker random delay and added average delay to base build time. Okay. Very good. Stasis. The Stasis Ward, that is. Attack target priority increased from 10 to 20. Attackers will no longer prioritize other units over a Stasis Ward and are now prioritized equally. Again, if you are not a pro gamer, this is going to make targeting those things a little bit easier. Stasis units can now be issued basic orders executed after the Stasis effect expire expired. So a theme that you'll notice here, right, is that a lot of these changes are to help everybody below the top 50 in the world. Which I honestly think is an excellent, excellent idea. Even though all of these changes are very small and very minor, I think it's going to feel much better overall. The Raven. Fix an issue where the units affected by interference matrix could not be issued stop commands. Fix an issue where the units affected by interference matrix would walk forward below their attack range when given attack move commands. And interference matrix, a matrix rather now pauses the immortal barrier cooldown for the correct amount of time. Uh, from 5.7 to 7.9. Okay. Spawn Locust no longer interrupts the current order for the Swarm Host. Okay. Oh, okay. I see. All right. Uh, hatcheries, Lair, and Hive. Subgroup priority change from Hatchery, Lair, to Hive. To Hive, Lair, Hatchery. Oh, okay. So you won't accidentally morph in an additional Lair if you're using Grid Hotkeys, I guess. That's actually kind of nice. So now if you have everything on one control group. I didn't actually know about this one. That's all. Yeah, nice. Okay, general changes as well, and that's the last of it. Fix an issue where the mule could be cast targeting refineries close to a command center, okay? Fix an unintended behavior being displayed on Nidus Worms. Fix an issue where Mutalisk attack launch sound would play each time the attack bounced. Fix an issue where Morph to Ravager would be cancelled with a smart command issued immediately after the Morph command. Same for the Lurker. Fix an issue where Zerklings could not receive cute Morph to Baneling commands. Fix an issue where Zerklings and Swarmos could not be given commands while unburrowing. I've noticed this one before, didn't know it was a bug. Fix an issue where Liberators could not be given certain commands immediately after being ordered to unsiege. Fix an issue where the Thor in high impact payload mode would not collide with Locust. Fix an issue with the attack animation of Thor when using the Tyrador skin. Fix an issue or variety of incorrect upgrade and unit scores. How much score you get should equal the combined resource costs. Okay, don't care about that. Unit scores doesn't really do anything. Uh, fix an issue where certain flying units and buildings did not cause water ripples when flying over water. Standardize the height at which an air unit will cause water ripples. Okay, nice. Fix an issue where... Yeah, this is actually a thing with some structures, if I'm not mistaken. Like, some Terran structures would cause ripples, but then others did not. And I know that it's the same for some of the flying units too, so apparently now everything is going to create ripples, which is kind of nice. Fix an issue where simultaneously using mass recall and strategic recall could move the target at yes. So this was actually a funny little bug that someone discovered some time ago, where if you queue up mass recall first and then you use strategic recall on the nexus, the units would just appear in a different place entirely, um, which was very fun. Uh, not sure exactly how often that would ever be used in a game, but I guess they uh, nipped it in a butt before it could really be an issue. Fix an issue where the Ravager's Corrosive Bile animation would override the Burrow animation, okay? Fix the shield battery restore not showing its range when interacting with the UI. Fix an issue where changing a warp in speed did not change the animation speed. Fix an issue where the shield battery's autocast targeted the Dark Shrine. Really? Okay. Fix an issue where the Reapers threw their grenades with the wrong hand. Okay, well that's it. The game is unplayable now, man. I can't believe it. They used to throw it with their left hand. They were lefties? Finally, the game is once more playable. Thank God. I don't even know what hand they use. Anyways, uh, fix an issue where changelings would permanently switch sides after Neural Parasite. 
<laughs> Wait, someone out there is actively neuraling the opponent's changelings in Zerk vs. Zerk? Okay. Fix an issue where burrowed swarm hosts and ravagers collided with burrowed movers. Roaches now change their collision after researching tunneling claws. Fix an issue where zealots' second hit could damage units that were in stasis, invulnerable, lifted, or very far away. The maximum distance to receive damage is now 2.1. Fix an issue where the queen's second hit could damage units that were in transport stasis, invulnerable, lifted, or very far away. The maximum distance to her attacks is 5. The reaper is now 7. Fix an issue where the Thor's second hit could damage units that were in transport, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Fix an issue where the Colossus attack could damage units that were in stasis, invulnerable, lifted, or very far away. The maximum range is now 9 plus 2 with an upgrade. Fix an issue where Metavax could heal units affected by his stasis. And <laughs> fix an issue where shield batteries could recharge units affected by stasis as well. Okay. So there it is. I'm just kidding. There's a little bit more. I know some of you are triggered by this. At the very bottom of this page, we have the fact that the 1v1 map pool has now been updated with the maps that I've been casting games on for a little while already. Tournaments have been using these for a couple of weeks, but now they're also on the ladder. Okay, so, huge new patch, significant set of changes. All of the changes individually are, are relatively minor, but it is definitely going to shake up the professional meta quite a bit. I am Karavitsa, the World Championships is coming up very soon. This will be played with the new patch, and this will also be with the new map pool. Um, so, we'll have to see what that's going to be like. Maybe it's going to suck for the players a little bit, especially for the Protoss players, who are probably going to need a little bit more time to prepare for this patch, but um, it's going to be exciting to watch, that's for sure. I think that about sums it up. I am very interested in hearing your thoughts on these changes. Please let me know down below in the comment section of this video. I am personally very excited for it. Again, to sum it up, love the Zork plays, uh, the, the Zork changes. I really like the Terran changes. Not so sure about the Protoss ones, but uh, I do think over time it will probably balance out. But I can imagine Protoss is going to need a little bit of time. Uh, the new maps are also a little, little, little tricky for Protoss, it seems. At least initially. The, the thing is, when you look at statistics right now, Okay, I, I'm, I'm just going to go off on one more ramble, and then I'm closing out this video, because it's getting way too long. Um, the thing is, right, if you look at Grandmaster League, I don't know what the exact numbers are currently, but a very significant amount of the Grandmaster League population is Protoss. At some point, it was like 60% of the users in Grandmaster League were Protoss. However, at the tippity top of the skill level, it seems that it's mostly Zerks and Terrans winning tournaments, at least until Hero returned from his mandatory military service some time ago. Couple reasons as to why that is. First off, some of the very best Protoss players in the world either had to retire or are currently doing their mandatory military service. That doesn't really help. Um, but secondly, overall as well, it's difficult. So, so, okay, so to, before I go completely off track, if you look at the statistics for the maps currently and you look at the win-loss ratio of these new maps and uh, these new games that are played with the new patch on the new maps, you will look at the win-loss ratio for Protoss and say, okay, Protoss is underpowered. The thing is that for a lot of the Grandmaster League population, right, about like half of it is Protoss, and a lot of those players will be participating in the smaller online tournaments. StarCraft 2 has started an update and now it's playable. Okay. Anyways, in the early rounds for those weekly cups that I cast a lot of replays from, say it's like a 32-man tournament, it is not uncommon to have like 50% of those players be Protoss. Like there are usually just more Protoss signups overall. Because of that though, there's also lower tier Protoss players that are caught up in those statistics. We haven't really seen that many games of the top tier Protoss players on the new patch. I mean, I've been trying to cast those games. I've casted like a lot of Astrea, I've casted a bunch of Hero, I've casted uh, a little bit of Showtime here and there. Like I've, I've casted a bunch of their matches. Max Specs, not playing as much right now, but it's it's um, kind of difficult to go off of the initial stats just because, yeah, we, we need real main premier tournament results to properly judge this. I think if you look at like the IEM Katowice round of 16, we can then properly start drawing some conclusions, I think. But right now it still feels a little bit early. Anyhow, hope you enjoyed watching this video. If you want to help me out and... Maybe try to get this video out to more people. Take the one second that it takes to hit the like button down below. If you didn't like it, you could also hit the dislike button guilt free. But for now, thank you very much for watching. Have a great rest of your day. Don't forget to smile, and I'll see you once again in the next one.